everybody. Welcome back to the Compass Church and to week five of our six week series entitled In the Beginning, a study of the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. Well, today I come to you from a historic site. Friends, I am at the location of the very first nuclear reactor in all of the world. In fact, the nuclear reactor is still here. It's just buried in the ground right here. You can't see it, but I can feel the nuclear energy. No, I can't feel nothing, but it's weird being so close. You say, Jeff, where are you? Well, welcome to Lamont, Illinois. No kidding. Lamont, this historic town, just three miles south of our Bolingbrook campus, was founded back in 1833 from settlers who found this spot on the Des Plaines River and said, let's make a town. Today, Lamont is only 17,000 people, relatively small from suburban comparisons, but hugely important because Lamont is where technology was developed that might end the world. <laughs> Let me explain. Albert Einstein back in 1939 wrote a very sensitive letter to the president, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And in the letter, Einstein said, my fellow scientists and I are working on some technology that could potentially create the greatest weapon the world has ever seen, the nuclear bomb. Uh, we need funding, he requested, and the president said, you've got it. One of the things they did was started to rent this golf course. No kidding, it was an abandoned golf course here in Lamont. The scientists here started calling it the country club. Hey, we're going to the country club. But it was a top secret laboratory designed to develop the science behind the atomic weapons. They actually moved the first reactor from the University of Chicago, where it was developed and a nuclear reaction happened in that reactor under the bleachers at the football stadium, no kidding. But when they saw the power they were dealing with, they said, we can't afford to risk a meltdown in the city of Chicago. And so they quickly brought it out, that reactor brought out here, built another reactor, operated them doing experiments with nuclear reactions until, yes, the technology existed to create the first atomic bombs. Then they buried the reactors and the radioactivity was very high for a long time, for decades. Nobody was allowed back here, but just recently scientists have said, oh, I think it's safe. We can allow crazy pastors and others to visit the location. And so let's go back to being in Lamont during World War II. Do you think they were curious about what was happening behind the fence that they weren't allowed to go in, in that old golf course, the country club? You bet they were curious. And they would ask the guards and they would ask the scientists. You know, the scientists would come out to go to the cafe or the local store, but the guards, the scientists, nobody would give the people of Lamont any idea as to what was happening in their town. The reason, well, well there was military reasons that it had to be top secret, but do you think the people of the town would have been better served with knowledge of what was happening? Would they have been blessed by that knowledge? Would they have slept better at night knowing that if a mistake happens over at the golf course, Lamont will be exploded into oblivion? No, that probably would not have been helpful knowledge. Would they have felt good about knowing? They're right over there. The technology is being developed that'll put the world in fear for decades to come still to today. I don't think that that knowledge would have served them well. Friends, there's some knowledge that though we might be curious, doesn't help. In fact, can be damaging to the quality of our lives. This notion of ignorance being bliss is true as it relates to the topic we will study today, namely the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis 3, we find out that God invited Adam and Eve to enjoy the fruit of the nearly endless supply of wonderful trees. But God gave one prohibition. He said, the one tree in the middle of the garden, I ask you to obey me and not eat 
from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Why wouldn't God want them to have knowledge? Isn't knowledge a good thing? And they probably wondered, the tree of knowledge, uh, they knew knowledge, they knew good. They didn't even know what evil was. The, the name must have been puzzling to Adam and Eve. They were like, what's evil? And why, why don't we want knowledge of that? Friends, as it turns out, God was trying to protect them. There was a reality, a cosmic conflict that was happening in the universe between Satan, his demons, leading the kingdom of darkness, waging war against God, his angels, and the kingdom of light. And the Lord was like, Adam and Eve, trust me, you're in paradise. You've got me. You've got everything you need. You don't need to know about evil. Friends, ignorance can be bliss. Think about little kids. It's interesting. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, the Bible says that your little children have no knowledge of good and evil. And you don't want to give it to them too early. I remember back when my daughter Jora was only three years old. That was when the terrorist attacks of 9-11 took place. And Jen and I were around our TV, very concerned with what we were seeing. Little Jora could sense something was up. And she asked, Mom and Dad, what's going on? We chose to leave her in the dark, to not tell her. She didn't need to know about terrorism, about death, about people who wanted to kill us. She didn't need to know about evil. And so it was with Adam and Eve. God said, trust me, you're good. But sadly, Adam and Eve followed the temptation of Satan and ate the fruit of the tree. They did the one thing God said not to do. And in doing so, they joined the rebellious ones, those who don't follow God's wisdom. And as they did, they were thrust into the middle of the battle that God was trying to keep them out of. And yes, by experiential discovery, they found out about the cosmic conflict. They found themselves in the midst of that war. Friends, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this drama that surrounds it, we need to study it because we have learnings there that will help us in our quest to know God, specifically to know the goodness of God's heart. So, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil Turns out that that wasn't the only tree God created. To have the fuller story, we got to read about all the trees. Look at this, Genesis 2.9. The Lord made all kinds of trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Friends, do you see the the love of God in this? God says, I'm going to prepare a garden of Eden for these people who are made in my image that will be such a blessing. And so the many trees that God made were delightful in two ways. They were aesthetically delightful. Just looking at them, they were like, no way, this is like art museum. And they were Uh, culinary delightful. (laughs) They ate them and and they picked the fruits off of the many trees and they were delicious. And so God conveys his goodness to his people by filling the garden with trees that are beautiful and delicious. Look at Genesis 2.16. God said to them, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. The Lord's invitation to them that they would enjoy what he has made because he made it for them. What a beautiful picture of God's goodness. I love the concept of God's goodness. Uh, Let's talk about it, shall we? The 20th century theologian by the name of Louis Burkhoff defined goodness, God's goodness, in this way. Goodness is the perfection of God that prompts him to deal bountifully and kindly with his people. God is good to us. We, we see that so clearly in the creation of the Garden of Eden and throughout scriptures, most poignantly in the death of Christ on our behalf. God is so good. And yet you may say, well, what about that tree of evil? You know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Doesn't that uh, take away from God's goodness? No. Friends, I maintain 
that even the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was yet another expression of God's goodness. Let's read about it. Verse 17, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So many trees, but one of them in the middle of the garden, and God said, that's the one tree, that's the one rule, don't eat from it. Friends, was this a magic tree that, you know, these fruits, you know, boom, you eat it and your brain just goes crazy? No, I don't, well, I don't think it was. I think it was just like any of the other trees in the garden. What made it significant is that it was the one that tested their willingness to obey, to follow God. The Lord just picked it and said, Here, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make it possible for you to rebel and choose not to follow me by giving you one rule. I'll tell you what, don't eat of that tree. And friends, uh, that decision of God was actually a gift. What it did is it gave us, if you will, free will. You know, we were not following God because we were forced to. People followed God because they chose to, or if they chose to rebel, there was a path for that. If you will, in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we see how much God wants love for him to be a choice, free will. When I say that love requires choice, do you resonate with that? For, for example, th this teddy bear. Uh, it's a very cute teddy bear, I think you'd agree. And it's got this little button on its paw. Listen to this. I love you. Did you hear that? I love you. Yeah, how about that? You know, if you're having a bad day and you just need a little love, hug the teddy bear, have him tell you, I love you. That'll just make your heart sore, huh? No, at a certain point you realize it's inanimate. It's not a real thing and it doesn't really love me. It's just recording and saying what it's uh, told to say. Similarly, God did not want us to be robots. I love you, God, you know, just programmed to do so. But no, he wanted it to be a choice. He made us in his image with free will. And if we followed him, if we choose him, it would be a real choice choice. And so the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has a potential downside that we see. But its upside was God said, people, I want relationship, love, choice behind our connection. Isn't that beautiful? Well, let's, let's uh, move on, shall we? Chapter 3, now verse 1. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made the serpent. We find out that this appearance of a snake was in fact Satan disguised. The book of Revelation, two times actually, chapter 12 and chapter 20, tells us that this, this lying snake was none other than the devil or Satan, this leading angel who turned in rebellion against God and brought a third of the angels with him in his new kingdom of freedom. It's really a kingdom of darkness as they rebel from God. That's who this is. He manifests himself or uh, inhabits a snake and he's crafty. The word crafty can mean sneaky, but it also speaks to intelligence. I mean, clearly he can talk. And so you can bet Eve is going to be delighted in a talking option, you know, a conversation was minimal in the garden. He, he had the Lord, obviously the best, and she had her husband, Adam, but every wife eventually becomes disappointed in the uh, conversation <laughs> a husband provides. And so finding a, a snake that is bright, she didn't realize he was evil. She had no knowledge of evil. Yeah, he was in disguise. She just saw him as a creature of the Lord that she could converse with. Interesting, when Satan comes our way, he's in disguise too. Uh, we don't even realize we're being tempted. Thoughts come our way and we're, we're oblivious to the fact that this is the evil one. And she was oblivious that it was the evil one. But what we're going to see, this is really fascinating. Obviously, they're going to talk about the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the temptation. But what's fascinating is that the tree is really the secondary focus of their conversation. The primary focus of their conversation is God himself. That's interesting. With temptation, 
the number one thing Satan tries to do is lower our view of God. And that's what happens here. Friends, we're about to read the first conversation about God. Now, let's see. Chapter 3, verse 1 continues. The serpent said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? That's so fascinating. Friends, here, the snake is, if you will, saying, I can't believe God said that. That's just like him, him and his rules, he and his prohibitions. First of all, he's wrong, right? Did God say you must not eat from any tree? No, God said you must not eat from one tree. So he's twisting what God said. But this question, did God really say that? is essentially throwing shade on the Lord, tell, telling Eve that, you know, that's the problem with God. He's so stingy, if you will, that Satan here is trying to get Eve to doubt God's generosity. The truth was God has been so generous. He had said, I've made all these trees. You're free to enjoy them all. There's just one. It's going to be the test of your willingness to follow me. Let's just make that one tree off limits. God was so generous. And yet, Satan has this capacity to say, you know, God and his rules, 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 rules. He's just trying to rob us from the good. And sure enough, uh, Satan today tries to make people doubt God's generosity, that God's in fact stingy. He's trying to keep the good stuff from you. Well, Eve clarifies. She goes, no, 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 just one tree we can't eat. God said that when we eat of that, will surely die. Look what Satan says, verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Well, what is Satan saying about the Lord in this statement? He's a liar. He lied to you. When he told you that he eat of that tree, you will die, he was lying. Friends, this is doubting God's integrity, one aspect of his goodness, generosity, that was one aspect of his goodness, but his integrity, that he's faithful and true in all that he says and does. Satan's saying, you know, God, you know, sometimes he'll tell you how it is. Other times he'll just lie to you. Unbelievable. His effort is trying to lower people's view of God. Well, next, verse 5, Satan continues. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Interesting. Satan says what is technically true. It's true that eating of the fruit will thrust them into the cosmic conflict, and they will now have knowledge of good and evil in the war about. And uh, we, we, we know that, in fact, God has that knowledge. And so in that way, yes, they would be like God. And it's fascinating how Satan has the capacity to take a true statement, but to spin it in a way that makes it look like God's trying to hold something wonderful away from them, trying to press them down. It's as if Satan's saying, listen, I'm offering you advancement. You can aspire to a greater position than the one assigned to you from the Almighty. You eat of that fruit, boom, you're going to grow in knowledge and you'll be like God himself. Promising power and prestige. And uh, this is really doubting God's love. You see, he was saying, ah... The Lord is trying to keep you from the tree because he doesn't really have your best interest in mind. He's trying to keep you down. But uh, you eat that fruit that he's forbidden, you will experience a better life. There's a better life apart from following him. You follow him, you'll miss out. Friends, the love of God is manifest in that all of his commands are for our best interest. He is not trying to hold us down, but lift us up and enable us to experience life with him, life at its best. But Satan says, ah, God doesn't really care about you like you think. He's trying to suppress your life. And sadly, 
this promise of uh, yeah, autonomy, you can be your own ruler. This promise of delight, oh, the fruit is so good. This promise of discovery, oh, there's knowledge that you don't have, and it's wonderful. This promise of advancement, you'll be promoted to godlike status. It's too much for Eve. She's bought the lie. She's doubted the goodness of God. Look at verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. By the way, weren't all the trees we just read uh, good for food and pleasing to the eye? They all were. But this one was also desirable for gaining wisdom. Wisdom. Yeah, thrust into the conflict of evil and good. She She took some of the fruit and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. <laughs> it's kind of sad. Uh, I'm like, Adam, what's going on here? He's so passive. He's like, what? Okay. Uh, just not a bright, shining moment for Adam either. And folks, in their choice to follow the advice of Satan and disobey from God, Pandora's box was open and everything had changed. From that point on, humanity was caught up in this cosmic war and thrust into rebellion against the good, good God. Such a sad story. Next week, we'll learn about the rescue, but hold on. Uh, There's good news next week. Friends, I just want to end by asking you, how good is God? Satan's trying to get you to lower your view of God, trying to hint, yeah, he's not that good to you. And it's just not true. The goodness of God is, it's five star. You know, the star system, it's used for rating how good a movie is, one to five stars. It's used for rating restaurants, hotels. Let's use it for a second, shall we? There are some people who say, ah, God's pretty good, but yeah, I'd give him a two and a half stars. Friends, where would you put God? Satan would love to get you to view God as a four or a three and a half. If he can lower your view of God, he, well, many people are increasingly disinterested in spiritual things. Many people are like, ah, you know, there's religion, God thing, but I would rather pursue my hobbies, my career path, my collection of possessions. Why? They're disinterested in God because they've got a low view of how good he is. He's two and a half stars. Others are believers, they've become a Christian, but they're apathetic in their spiritual zeal. They're more excited about other aspects of their life, and their Christian life is, is, is downplayed. They're apathetic, they're half-hearted. It's all because they've got a low view of God. When you believe that God is the single greatest reality in the universe, that there's nothing as beautiful and wonderful as he You will center your life around pursuing him, obeying him, proclaiming him, serving him. You know, I I will tell you, God is not five stars. God's off the chart. I remember when I discovered that for my own story for a long time. I, as a young man, was spiritually apathetic. I said, ah, God is decent. You know, Satan had worked in me and lowered my view of the goodness of the Lord. I didn't realize it was Satan, but that's what had happened. And it was with great effect. I was apathetic. But when I discovered what is going on, the beauty of God blew me away. The love of God, the the goodness of God as he wanted not only to save my soul by giving me forgiveness through Christ, but to lead my life into meaningful uh, commitment to his cause where there would be significance to my days, excitement as he lead. I discovered God is the single greatest reality in the universe. He's not just five stars. He's off the charts. Nothing compares to him. May we know it. May we not be duped by Satan's effort to get us to misunderstand what's going on. Sometimes there is confusion, you know. Eating of the fruit has led to much pain and suffering. We'll learn about that next week. But it doesn't deter or lower the goodness of God. He is amazing. May you know it. May you enjoy it. Let's pray. 
Father, so grateful for your goodness. So grateful that there is nothing that even comes close to you. We're, we're glad to know how Satan works. He wants nothing more than to lower our view of you. So help us, God. Help all my friends who are watching here online. May they know that you are so good. Even when they don't understand why this, that, or the other thing has happened or hasn't happened. May they know that you are to be trusted. You are to be pursued, served. You are to be uh, shared with others because there's nothing like the goodness of God. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.